This week on Arizona Illustrated, unbroken and unflinching. I remember being bullied as a young kid because of my culture or because of my race. The endangered red squirrel. They're kind of like salmon that swim upstream and only reproducing once. Growing music from the ground up. Once you pick them from the vine, they have a green hue to them. You want them to be more brown and lightweight. And an Arizona profile. I eat it all. <laughs> Welcome to Arizona Illustrated. I'm Tom McNamara. Over the past year, Arizona public media producers Gisela Tellis and Tom Klespe have been working on the AZPM original documentary, Not Broken, which premieres Monday, October 30th at 9 p.m. on PBS 6. It's a candid, unflinching, yet hopeful one-hour film about the lives of seven young people coping with mental illness, told in their own brave words. Tonight, we introduce you to them and hear their voices in this Arizona Illustrated exclusive. I was a pretty happy child, like throughout, you know, like elementary school and stuff. Grandparents always will come to every single one of my sports events. They'll support me no matter what. I remember it was like really happy and um, I just, you know, would go out and play a lot. I remember a lot of like fun times with my sister. I was really easygoing as a child. I had a really big imagination, so like I would just go out and play and like pretend I was like an astronaut, a policeman. Barbies, I would just be in there for hours just playing. As a kid, we were a very close-knit um, do-or-die family. Like if somebody messes with one of us, they got to mess with all of us. You know, we would get into fights every now and again, but, you know, in the end, we would come out stronger for it. So I went to a Catholic and a Lutheran school, and, like, all of my mom's friends are gay. Like, all of them are lesbians. Fourth or fifth grade, where they tell you that all gays are evil and they're all going to hell. I'm sorry. Like, being told that the person that you look up to the most is going to hell when you're, like, 12 years old is, like, a really fucking big deal. Like really big deal, really took me out. I remember being bullied as a young kid. I mean, one of the biggest things of when I was bullied was because of my culture or because of my race, um, stuff like that. When I was 12 was when I was first suicidal and I told a middle school basketball coach and he said, don't worry about it, it's not that serious, you'll get over it. And I was like, dude, I just told you I wanted to die. Like, you should have paid more attention to me. But I wasn't actually diagnosed with any, anything until I was 16. I actually started seeing a psychiatrist too, um, and that's when I like officially got diagnosed with um, major depressive disorder and major anxiety disorder. Being diagnosed at the age of 12 with schizophrenia, depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder. Bipolar disorder, rapid cycler with depressive tendencies and uh, schizoid manifest manifestations. Serotonin syndrome, um, psychosis, and catatonia. Depressed and anxious. PTSD, uh, bipolar, um, ADHD. The biggest thing that I learned that was really important to me was that it's the way your brain functions. If you have a child that has diabetes, it's not any different than a child that has a mental illness. They're both diseases. They just affect different parts of your body. My biggest issue always has been saying, I'm bipolar but I recently have been able to learn to say I have bipolar disorder. People don't say I am cancer. People don't say I am diabetes. They have cancer, they have diabetes. So there's all this anxiety that's built up and it feels like it just is, needs to be somehow let out. Like it was, like I had no other way of dealing with it. If I was in school and I felt like I needed to, I would just take like a pencil and like scratch it against myself. Like if I was at home, I just took like dull uh, nail cutters. It just have over the years progressively have gotten worse. And so it's gotten to the point where it's possibly needed stitches. Mainly what I was thinking was like that people were after me, maybe like, you know, kind of like spying on me. 
Like, I almost kind of thought that they were, like, actors who were dressed up as my friends. It was scary because I was in a psych ward of a hospital, um, which, you know, I had never been in before. And it just, yeah, it just seemed like totally um, something, a situation that I never imagined myself getting into. Come on. So there's the panic and fear and this idea that I'm just going to be torn apart from the inside. And then the elation of striding through life like I can conquer anything and I'm invincible. Come on. Go, go, go. Come on. Abandoned by pretty much everyone I cared about. Um, got locked up in a place where people didn't really care about me in multiple places, um, which didn't give me a lot of reason to, to do any constructive change. Because, you know, if you look around and nobody cares, like, why should you care, right? I thought my depression couldn't get any worse when I left high school, and then I went to college, and then it got worse, and I, like, lost myself for real, like, actually lost myself in it. Um, so right now I'm still trying to find anything anything that used to be there at all. So mostly what I rely on for any form of happiness is like drugs. Games and a spooky time. When I was seeing voices and everything, I always saw them attached to people. But whenever I looked at someone, I saw a certain figure or a person standing next to them, and which always told me like it was danger. Like I saw an evil shadow back next to them. And I mean, it was always like, with wings or the shadows would change with every single person I, I meet. And it really spiraled, like I started self-harming a lot. And then at that point it was also like, I think the suicidal thoughts came in like, I don't want to live anymore. What can I do to not live? People will be better off without me. It was crazy. I attempted suicide, I think, six more times within seven, eight months. I think about suicidal ideation almost every minute of every day. So, I mean, the chances of me doing something like that are very high. That second time I attempted suicide, like, I was just telling my mom that, I, hey, I wanted to kill myself, and it was, and they agreed. I told them, I want to be locked up. I agreed. I told them, I want to be put in a safe place, and, they, and at that point was, like, the behavioral health hospital, people, they thought it was the safe choice. There was a point where I couldn't get it off my mind, like, I would be in school and I'd be thinking about it. I couldn't let go of this thought of, like, oh, I can just be gone, I can just disappear, you know? And things would be so much easier. Like, every time I did anything, I was like, you should just die. Like, I, I would be biking to campus, and I'd be like, you should just go in the middle of the street and just die. <laughs> and it was awful, and it's like, that's my rock bottom, is like still living with that there at all times. Because it's not a passing thought, and it's every time I'll see anything dangerous, it's like, oh, do it, because you just die. Just die. <laughs> I was just like, I need to tell my parents, you know, I'm suicidal, like, I, I need to see somebody. So they got me into psychiatrists and psychologists the next day. Right now I have an integrated healthcare system where I have a psychiatrist, a therapist, and a general practitioner and a case manager who all work together. And that's really, that's a really great way to do it, I think. So it's been a long journey and a bunch of different hospitals and all that. Since I've taken a lot of different medications, um, I know which ones work for me and which ones don't work for me. Um, yeah, like, like the ones that aren't really as necessary and the ones that, you know, are definitely like, you know, I need to take every day. This journey has been more about me learning about myself and how to cope and how to deal with things. Through medication and counseling, I've made a lot of improvement. I have changed a lot and become a more happy person than I was, for sure. <laughs> I'm a firm believer um, that there are, there are things out there, people out there, um, that would change my life for the better. Um, I just haven't found them yet, or they haven't found me. Um, and I fully intend to look for them. Even if you don't have a supportive family, you can always find a support system. Like, groups, even maybe that one friend that's willing to be by your side. 
but I am blessed and lucky to say that my parents have been really supportive of me throughout this whole journey. I always say, like, I wouldn't be here without what they've done for me, what they've sacrificed for me, and what they still give to me now. I just always remember feeling so alone about my mental illness and about my headspace and about all the crappy shit that happened in there and about all the shit that sends me off, like, triggers me, makes me go crazy. Like, I just want other people to, like, know that they're not alone, you know? No one's really alone. Like, no matter how messy and complicated your emotions are, like, you still deserve to talk about them. You can learn more about these young people, the filmmakers, and the full-length documentary on our website at azpm.org slash notbroken. And remember to tune in for the premiere Not Broken, Monday, October 30th at 9 p.m. on PBS6. One of the rarest animals in the world has suffered a devastating setback in Arizona. Experts say over the summer, a 50,000-acre fire killed more than 200 Mount Graham red squirrels. Already on the endangered species list, their population is down to just about three dozen. This small, rare squirrel is found only in southeastern Arizona and is now dangerously close to extinction. This story from Tony Paniagua was produced earlier this year before the fire. A refreshing evergreen forest in southeast Arizona is home to one of the rarest animals in all of North America, and you won't find it anywhere else in the world. These are the Pinaleno Mountains near Safford, Arizona. They are home to the Mount Graham Red Squirrel, which lives in a green oasis high above the mountain's base. Fewer than 300 remaining red squirrels inhabit this sky island environment. It is a small animal, could fit in the palm of your hand, but it is an incredibly uh, hardy animal that has been left behind on Mount Graham above 9, 10,000 feet for about the uh, last 10,000 years since the last ice age. We have red squirrels in the White Mountains, but that's a different subspecies, and this subspecies is only found on Mount Graham. The territorial squirrels claim an area where they build a nest on a tree. They also use a handy storage facility on the ground. It's called a midden, M-I-D-D-E-N. If you look, it's, it's real spongy, and that's just the buildup of cones over time. Tim Snow is a wildlife specialist with the Arizona Game and Fish Department. He's familiar with the squirrel structures on the mountain. It feeds on pine cones mostly. It'll gather a cone, it removes the scales, the scales become the midden, and the midden acts as a refrigerator for pine cones. So the squirrel buries pine cones when they're green, they come back and dig them up and get to the seed. They like the denser, shadier habitat. Uh, that's exactly what they're looking for because if you think about it, the sun's going to bake that midden and heat it up and it won't be effective. The squirrels have survived despite predators such as the Mexican spotted owl and other raptors. The past few decades have been especially challenging. Last century, humans introduced another type of squirrel to the area that can compete with the red squirrel. They also erected the Mount Graham International Observatory in the 1990s, established campgrounds and other recreational areas for the public, and built roads for easier access. Controversy with the scopes was just loss of habitat again. Uh, it's a small footprint, so it's not like, uh, oh, that's going to wipe out all the squirrels that are ever there. Um, but certainly, any time you take uh, uh, a development and you take away the habitat, then you're piecemealing that and, and so it's slowly, you know, you're taking a chunk at a time. Presently, the biggest threat to the red squirrel's habitat is fire, a threat made worse by drought and insect infestations that are weakening and killing trees. Fires can wipe out thousands of acres in a matter of days, as they did in 1996 and again in 2004. We've lost much of that high quality habitat. 
John Kaprowski is a wildlife and conservation management professor at the University of Arizona and an expert on squirrels. On Mount Graham, individuals survive um, not even quite two years and they only reproduce once in their lifetime. So they're kind of like salmon that swim upstream and end up only reproducing once. And as a result, the population size is relatively small and their ability to respond to changes in the environment is not, um, there's not a very quick response time. A pilot breeding program at Phoenix Zoo's Conservation Science Department hopes to make a difference in the future. So this is um, Meryl. She's a female that we acquired for the Mount Graham Red Squirrel. Stuart Wells and his team are trying to learn as much as possible about the little animals to see if captive reproduction will be possible. When will females be receptive, for example? Will they get pregnant and produce offspring in an artificial setting? Our goal is to establish a consistent breeding program in case they need to augment the wild population of Mount Graham red squirrels uh, as if that population continues to decline. It hasn't been easy so far. The squirrels are rodents, but they are nothing like rabbits or mice. Don't even think about keeping them in the same cage together. In the wild, each squirrel has a distinct territory which they protect. So one of the challenges of managing these animals in the setting is to try and maintain that important territoriality, but at the same time, we need to figure out when is the best time to put them together to get a successful breeding. So one of the things we have to consider is the, the health and safety of the animals that we're cared for. The zoo has recorded one breeding, the first in the world, but no babies up to this point. I'm gonna go ahead and let the female into the tunnel and we'll see what happens. And then once, once you have your sheet going, we'll start the vocalizations. Still, scientists say with the Mount Graham red squirrel and other imperiled animals, the clock is ticking. So a dedicated research process is vital. Some of these animals come with very little information about how they breed or how to care for them. So that's one of the benefits that we have is being able to work those kinds of things out. And producing an animal that can survive in the wild is probably one of the best feelings that we have and putting life back into its natural habitat. So I think that's what drives all of us here. This fall, the Mount Graham red squirrels face immediate challenges to survival, such as predation from raptors and scarcity of food. Experts plan to provide supplemental feeding stations. Long term, they'll need a healthy forest free of fire and drought. Like what you see on Arizona Illustrated? Visit our webpage at azpm.org to watch and share videos from this episode. You'll also find stories from future programs, an easy way to submit your own story idea, an archive of past episodes of Arizona Illustrated. And you'll find everything you need to stay connected with public broadcasting in Southern Arizona, azpm.org. Most farmers and gardeners who grow plants for food plan on eating the fruits of their labor. But there's a man in Patagonia, Arizona, who sees a different purpose for the harvest. Growing music from the ground up. My name is Zach Farley. I'm a musician and an instrument maker. I make instruments out of gourds, out of just about anything you could imagine, to be honest with you. I was at a show in Phoenix maybe 10, 15 years ago, and there was a gentleman who had a flute that was made out of a gourd, and I'm like, wow, this is really cool. And I said, you know, there's some people in Patagonia that grow gourds. Maybe I should go talk to them. They, they showed me these gourds and they showed me how to grow them and they showed me all the techniques and they pretty much schooled me on the gourd thing. So it was really cool for them to help me out in that way. So once you pick them from the vine, they have a green hue to them. You want them to turn yellow before you really start working on them. And, and when you pick them up, they're really heavy when they're green. You want them to be more brown and, and more lightweight. And you want to sort of be able to hear the seeds rattle inside. 
So we're at the shop now. We've come from the farm where, I, where I've grown all the gourds. Then I bring them here. And this is pretty much where they age and I clean them up and make them look nice. When I was young, um, about eight years old or so, my father had passed away in a motorcycle accident. And since then, I, I don't know, I felt like something was missing inside of me. And, and once I picked up the guitar, it, it filled that void in my heart. And it really, it gave me some confidence and a foot to stand on in this world. I don't know why, but it did. So. I like the chords and the melodies and the rhythms. and. It felt like an instrument that you could really put yourself into. And something about it just filled, kind of filled the void in my heart, I guess you could say. And yeah, I just haven't, haven't been able to stop since, so it's been a lot of fun for me. So this flute right here was designed after a sandhill crane. And this particular flute was made out of a piece of PVC. I bent the neck and, and added the eyes and gave it all the feathers and all that stuff, and it sounds really nice. I've played just about every instrument you could imagine, and then uh, the flutes, I got involved with the flutes maybe 15 years ago. I was working for a company named High Spirits, and in that time I tuned, a friend had told me that I tuned enough flutes that if I were to lay them on the road, they would go from Patagonia to California. So that, that's a pretty big number in my opinion. So. Never in a million years did I ever think I'd be growing gourds and playing with them. <laughs> but weirder things have happened. They get quite a bit of satisfaction out of that, to be honest with you. My motto is actually from seed to song, so that's pretty much what it is. You know, you take your seed, you put it in the ground, you grow it, you harvest it, you take the time to turn it into an instrument, and then you play it. Each year, the Tucson community comes together to celebrate the living traditional arts of Southern Arizona and Northern Mexico. This three-day event held in downtown Tucson is filled with a delicious diversity of ethnic foods, artisans, musicians, and cultures. Tucson, meet yourself in this week's Arizona Profile. it as a compliment that people call this Tucson Eat Yourself. The food is the bait. There's food, there's people, there's music. I'm Andy Berlin. I'm with the Arizona Daily Star. I'm the food writer. I think this is one of the most exciting food events of the year. It costs a lot of money to open a restaurant, even if it's small, or even a food truck, and a lot of times you have to play it safe. 
an event like this, a just one-time thing, allows people from other cultures to cook their food and get it out there and share it with other people. Busy. Dress for fun. We've been doing this for about 30 years. I'm making popovers fry bread. Well, fry bread is almost like a tortilla, but we use uh, secret ingredients in here, so we love doing it. People, community, all our love goes into the dough. <laughs> One of my favorites the last few years has been the Japanese takoyaki balls. They take this liquidy octopus kind of dough and they have these cute little waffle machines and they swirl around in the waffle machine until they're fried to a crisp. We're serving all kinds of Polish food. We've got traditional kielbasa, pierogi, we've got potato pancakes and guamki. And we also have... Here with the Lyconic Polish Dance Group. Not only is it a great community event, but it's also us building a community uh, and it's also our biggest fundraiser of the year. I think it has largely to do with Tucson and the eclectic background that Tucson has cultivated here. It's just fantastic. <laughs> It's wonderful to meet you. I'm so excited. I'm so glad you're here. Oh, it's the same. <laughs> My role was with the festival, but I helped start it. My wife and I pretty much began it. My role today is sort of honorary grandpa. High five. High five. High five. <laughs> so I think the most important thing we can do in this particular time, or at any time, is to turn people you don't know into people you've talked with. Not just talk about what they do, but about who they are. After 44 years, it's still working. Thank you for joining us here on Arizona Illustrated. Next week, managing freedom, Arizona veterans, and fostering hope. I'm Tom McNamara. See you then.